Hi everyone, this is Fabio here and in today's video I'm going to be explaining two of the most used communication protocols out there. These are going to be SPI and I2C and these are basically going to be extremely useful when trying to learn embedded systems. Why do we need SPI and I2C though when we have WART? And there's basically two drawbacks to WART which keep us from using it all the time and those are going to be the fact that it's asynchronous and then the fact that it only allows for two devices to communicate to each other. So the fact that it's asynchronous means that we have to always make sure that the baud rate settings are going to be the same on both devices before actually using them to communicate to each other. Now this has sort of been mitigated over the years because there's automatic baud rate detection now but not every circuit has this feature so it's still an issue a lot of the times. The fact that it's asynchronous also means that we have to assure a very high clock accuracy for both devices communicating or otherwise we'll end up with garbled data simply because there's no synchronization between the devices. Also this doesn't allow us to push for very high speeds because the clock accuracy would be even higher so we're basically limited to about 115 kilobaud rate. Secondly, WART is only meant for two devices and nowadays you would like to connect multiple devices to the same bus, so only using one peripheral on the microcontroller and this is just something that WART doesn't allow us to do. If you're interested in learning more about WART, the most basic way to communicate serially, I'm going to let you know that this video is part of a series I'm doing on embedded systems and the first video I did in this series actually covers WART and many other topics, so feel free to check out that video before watching the rest of this one. Now onto the first communication protocol we are going to talk about today. SPI or Serial Peripheral Interface is a communication protocol which allows multiple devices to talk on the same bus. Thankfully both SPI and I2C went through a much needed nomenclature change as part of the Black Lives Matter initiative. So as part of this video I'm going to use both the updated and the old names but you need to know that in most literature you're going to find the old names. So on an SPI bus there's always going to be only one controller who decides when a communication happens and it also decides which device it will communicate to and then one or more peripherals. So the way you can think of this is the controller has total control over the bus and then the peripherals need to comply to what the controller says. As far as data lines go we have two of them and those are going to be MASI or COPY which stands for controller out peripheral in and then we also have MISO or SIPO, which stands for controller in, peripheral out. Unlike WART, SPI is synchronous, which means we have to have a clock line between the controller and the peripherals, and this line is called SCK. Again, only the controller can output a clock signal to this line, and communication only happens when there is a clock signal on this line. What this means is that a peripheral cannot actually start a data transfer, it has to wait for the controller to do so. SPI is also always full duplex, meaning that when a controller sends data to a peripheral, the peripheral needs to send data back at the same time. So this kind of works like a shift register. Data comes through one end and data is being pushed out through the other end. When a controller asks a peripheral to do something and then it also expects data to be sent back, what it can do is it can actually wait a little bit after the first data transfer for the peripheral to actually gather the results and then it can generate a few clock signals so that the peripheral has the chance to send that data back. Again, the clock signal is being generated by the controller so the controller needs to know how long it would take the peripheral to actually gather the data. The way a controller signals to which device it's talking to is through a signal which is dedicated to each and every peripheral. And this is called SS or CS, which stands for chip select. Before actually outputting a clock signal to the clock line so that it starts a data transfer, a controller has to actually select which peripheral is going to talk to. Usually this happens by outputting a logical zero to the CS line connected to the peripheral. In the schematic that I've drawn to my right, you can see that we can share the two data lines between all of the peripherals, and this is basically because we have those peripheral chip selection lines. Apart from this approach, which is known as the independent peripheral approach, we also have daisy chaining, in which the data lines are connected from one peripheral to the other, so in order for a data packet to actually get to the last device in the daisy chain, it needs to be transferred to each and every device in that chain. Again though, the way you see things in this schematic over here is the way things happen most of the time in the real world. The daisy chain approach is really not that used. As far as speeds go, the SPI protocol doesn't define any fixed data rates, but out of the two protocols we are talking about today, this one is the fastest with speeds higher than one megabit per second most of the time. Now to give you an idea, you would mostly use SPI in scenarios where you absolutely care about the speed, 
but you don't have a lot of devices to connect to the bus, such as a RAM memory or any other device that really expects a high data rate. If you don't need this data rate though, you have an alternative, and that alternative is I2C or Inter Integrated Circuit. Just like SPI, I2C is a multi device communication protocol, with the difference being that with I2C you can actually have multiple controllers on one bus. There is only one data line referred to as SDA and only one clock line, SCL, both of which are going to be high when idle. This actually represents a huge advantage over SPI because it allows us to have multiple devices connected to the bus while still only having. Having two lines. If you can remember with SPI with each and every peripheral we would have added, we would have needed a separate chip selection line. The way a controller signals which peripheral it intends to communicate to is through a 7 to 10 bit address which is going to be sent out as the first frame of the data transfer. This frame is named address frame. Part of this address frame is also a read slash write bit which tells the peripheral if we want to send data to it or we expect data from it. The following frames are called data frames and they each contain 8 bits of data. Something that is shared between the address frame and the data frame is the acknowledge or not acknowledge bit. This bit is the last bit in the frame and is actually the responsibility of the receiving device. So the device that actually receives this frame has to pull the data line low if it managed to receive the data frame successfully, otherwise the data line will just default to the idle state, which is logical one. Now in order to start a data transfer, the controller has to generate a start condition. What this means is the fact that it has to pull the data line low while the clock line is still high. On the opposite side, if it wants to generate a stop condition, it has to stop pulling the data line low, which means the data line is going to go to the logical one level when the clock line is already high. These two conditions are actually illegal during a data transfer, so they can only be generated at the beginning or at the end of one. During a normal data transfer, the SDA line is only allowed to have transitions when the clock line is low. Unlike WART or SPI, I2C is actually open drain, which means that devices connected to the bus can only pull the line low. The logical one idle states of both the data and the clock lines is being assured through two resistors connected between these two lines and the supply voltage. These resistors connected between the I2C lines and the supply voltage are called pull up resistors and what they do is they allow us to pull either line low and not cause a short circuit between ground and the supply voltage because there is a resistor between the two. One useful feature of I2C is the fact that it allows slower peripherals to actually hold the clock line low while they process the information or they finish some other process before actually acknowledging the frame that they just received. So they still have to acknowledge the frame by pulling the SDA line low, but that can be delayed a little bit. Another feature of i 2 c is the fact that it allows for repeated start conditions. So before generating a stop condition for a previous data transfer, the controller can actually choose to start a new data transfer. And it could be useful in case the controller wants to talk to a different device all in the same go or actually switch up between reading or writing from the same device. Data speeds are slower than SPI with two typical speeds being 100 kilohertz or 400 kilohertz, which is still faster than WART. I2C can come in handy in a lot of scenarios where speed is not of utmost importance, such as with sensors which have some integrated logic, with slower memories or with a lot of other devices. Now in the end, the approach I'd suggest for experimenting with both of these protocols is the same as in my last video, and that is to actually pick up a developer board, select a few devices you want to talk to like sensors or stuff like that and actually build a project, something that you're passionate about. Now I can't suggest you guys a project idea because that's going to depend on what you want to do, but I can recommend you a development board and that is going to be the MSP430 from Texas Instruments. And I've recommended this in the previous video as well, but I think that they provide great code examples and they have great documentation and it allows you to code really close to the hardware, which I think is really important if you want to learn embedded systems. There's going to be links in the description down below to both the MSP430 development board and a book on the MSP430, allowing you to learn a lot more if you want to get into it. Now, I actually got the topic for this video as a recommendation from the comment section of the previous video. So if you want to recommend a topic for the next video, make sure to leave a comment in the comment section down below. Anyways, I hope you learned something new from this video. Make sure to click the like button, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. Just like I said in the beginning, this is a series, so there's going to be more videos coming in the future regarding embedded systems. 
Thanks again for watching. Make sure to stay tuned. Peace out, guys. Peace.